Thank you for returning for my second part of a three-part analysis of the football knowledge of the independent football games Maximum Football 2020 and Axis Football 2020. The first part, uh, I assume you watched it, discussed some of the basic football concepts that both games fail to properly implement. This part will now talk about team building, play calling, and more general game strategy for each matchup, and the third and final part will discuss the individual player AI and reactions. The criticisms in these videos may seem harsh, uh, especially considering that these are low-budget indie games with limited resources. However, if the goal for us is to have quality simulation football games, I feel that we need to give these games the same level of scrutiny that we would give to Madden or any future 2K football games or any other football game past or present. In that spirit of constructive criticism, I now want to move on to another area of artificial intelligence and football knowledge. With the plays themselves not being particularly well designed in either game, it ends up not being particularly surprising to me that the CPU's use and execution of these plays also leaves a lot to be desired. If you were an inexperienced programmer making your very first football game, you would probably employ one of two methods of CPU play calling. The first would be for the game to simply wait for the user to pick their play, and then the game picks a play for the CPU team that is optimally designed to counter whatever play the user has selected. Maybe you pull it from a lookup table, assuming you have a small enough sample of plays that a lookup table is reasonable to implement. That way, the CPU would always seem to have the perfect play called for whatever you're doing and would give an illusion of difficulty. Uh, on the one hand, that would plain and simply be cheating. But on the other hand, it could also be easily countered by a human user simply selecting a play to force the defense into a particular scheme, and then just using an audible to change the play uh, to something that beats whatever you expect the defense to have called, assuming that the game supports audibles. On the other end of the spectrum, the CPU could just call completely random plays, which will be considerably less competitive, but, you know, not cheating. Misery. I pick number three. You don't even want to read them first? I was elected to lead, not to read. Number three. I don't think that either Axis or Maximum is at either of those two extremes. Both games seem to be attempting to make play calls based on down, yards to gain, field position, and game situation. These are the bare-bone basic variables for play calling in a football game. So far as I can tell, neither game is blatantly cheating in its play calling, and both games are at least attempting to make smart decisions with regard to what plays they call and in what situations they call them. For the most part, both games are competent in this regard, each game doing certain things better than the other. In real life, of course, it isn't quite that simple. Coaches are also factoring in their own personnel, their opponent's personnel, past play-calling tendencies, and they're anticipating how the opponent will react to your own play calls and execution. It's all very complicated stuff that I honestly do not expect a football game to get right, because, I mean, we aren't playing these games on Deep Blue or IBM's Watson. It would be nice to have some basic tendency recognition so that the human user can't repeatedly burn the AI by calling the same play or the same concept every single down or uh, every time they encounter a specific situation, such as a third down or a two-point conversion. It would also be nice if the CPU would recognize when one of its own plays is being particularly effective and then keep calling that play, especially in critical situations such as third downs, fourth downs, or two-point conversions. It would then be up to the user to recognize these CPU money plays and adjust your own play calling or execution to beat them. If it's too impractical to program AI to learn and adapt, then forcing the human user to learn and adapt as an alternative would be a good compromise. But like I said, that's still some pretty advanced stuff. And these games are, as I pointed out in the previous part, still struggling with things like making pulling linemen work. And to be fair, and to be honest, it's not like Madden is a masterclass in play calling either. Madden does not pick up on these sorts of tendencies and adjust to them either. You can run money plays all day in Madden, and the only response that EA has ever come up with is to implement rubber banding mechanics. 
if you take too much of a lead in a particular match, these rubber banding mechanics will kick in and make your players perform worse while simultaneously making the CPU players play like all-stars such that they suddenly shut down your game plan no matter what you call or how well you execute it on the field. This is in lieu of any sort of adaptive AI that will actually change its strategy or personnel in response to how the user is playing. And even then, some of Madden's money plays will still beat even the most rubbery of rubber band mechanics. Maximum and Axis do not, thankfully, have any rubber banding mechanics that I'm aware of or have noticed. These indie games will not ease up on the reins in order to let you come back, nor will they supercharge the CPU team if you go up by too much too early. If you're getting blown out, you have to change what you're doing, or at the very least start executing better yourself. So you only have your own honor to stop you from calling money plays repeatedly. I do applaud both Canuck and Axis for not resorting to blatant cheating in order to make the game feel more challenging and competitive than it actually is. That is, in fact, one of the key strengths that both games have against Madden. And the Mario Kart feel of many Madden games is one of the biggest complaints that we critics levy against that. The gameplay in Axis and Maximum feels more organic. It isn't dictated as much by lengthy animations that take control away from the player, or by scripting that makes the user feel like your inputs and decisions don't matter. The downside, as I alluded to before, is that the lack of rubber banding means that some kind of rudimentary adaptive AI becomes even more important for these games to be able to remain competitive. If the developers have too much integrity to program their games to cheat to win, then the only alternative is for the game to play better and make better decisions. There's really no two ways around it. And unfortunately for Canuck and Axis Games, artificial intelligence is hard. And designing a game that requires good artificial intelligence, as opposed to just scripting it to cheat, as noble and laudable as that might be, is a tough uphill climb. And we, as the gamers, have to understand and accept that it's going to take years for these studios to build up their AI engines to the simulation football level that we want. Now, look, I do not expect either of these games to get there overnight. And even if they took my videos as a roadmap on what to add or change, it would still take them years to implement all the things that I suggest or ask for. As a more practical matter, I am happy and will continue to support these games as long as each game continues to show steady and substantive improvement each year. Remember, the core complaint that sim gamers like me levy against Madden is not necessarily that Madden is a bad game. Rather, it is that the game, and the franchise mode in particular, hasn't seen any substantive upgrades in years. Some people say as, as long as 15 years. The moment that Canuck or Axis start releasing games that show negligible improvement or worse yet even regression from year to year, as EA has shown with Madden, I will stop buying and will stop supporting Maximum Football or Axis Football just as I have done with Madden. For example... One adjustment that I make frequently when playing defense in Axis football is to bring a safety down into the box to play edge containment against unbalanced offensive sets. The outside run game is very dominant in Axis and has been for as long as I've been playing the game. So I make this simple pre-play adjustment to try to force the CPU runner back inside where it's easier for one of my teammates to tackle him. Uh, sadly, the CPU doesn't know to do this type of outside containment on its own, and so hitting the outside leads to easy yards on the ground for the user, especially if you have a fast running back with like a B-plus speed rating or faster, who can outrun pursuing linebackers to the edge. I can run the ball all day, and the CPU will never meaningfully adjust to it. The best outcome for the CPU is if they maybe accidentally call a nickel or dime formation that leaves a defensive back on the side of the field to act as a force player and shut down my outside run. It's actually kind of ironic that a formation specifically designed for defending against the pass is actually one of the best counters for the run game as well. 
even if these nickel and dime formations are working against my running plays, the CPU will never recognize that that specific formation was successful, nor will it make an effort to keep calling that play or formation as a reaction to slow down my running game. And as an aside, I want to take this opportunity to point out that both games also make some mistakes in how they design some of their defensive plays in formation. I should have covered this in the previous video, but to be honest, it slipped my mind, so I'll try to talk about it briefly here. In both Maximum and Axis, defensive formations cannot be flipped. This means that running the ball to the offense's right in both games is slightly easier than running to the left because, in both games, the nickel back will always line up on the offense's left side, the defense's right side, leaving fewer outside defenders on the offense's right side. Again, this is something that the CPU doesn't recognize. Even if I run exclusively to the right of the formation, the CPU defense will never pick up on that and adjust to it, nor will they preferentially call run plays to the right in order to stay away from my nickel defender if I'm playing a lot of nickel defense. Uh, in the passing game, the inability to flip the defensive play call also leads to mismatches. If the offense's slot receiver lines up on the right side of the offense's formation, he may end up being covered by a safety or linebacker because the nickel back will stay on the opposite side of the field, probably covering the tight end or running back. Thus, if calling a multiple receiver package, you're more likely to get a good matchup if you put the multiple receivers on the right side of the offensive formation. Axis, at least, seems to have slightly smarter defensive alignment logic than Maximum does. In Axis, it appears that defensive backs will prioritize covering receivers and tight ends before they cover running backs, which means that a nickel or dime back may move to the opposite side of the field if there is an uncovered receiver on that side of the field. You can still force a linebacker to be matched up against a receiver with certain formations, but you have to get a bit more lucky with the CPU defense's play call. In maximum, I don't think I've ever seen a nickel or dime back move to the other side of the formation unless the offense is playing an empty set and that's the only person that he can cover. In Axis in particular, this can be exploited for easy completions on out and corner routes uh, run by speedy receivers being covered by slower linebackers. It can be exploited in maximum as well, but it's much harder to complete the pass because of QB accuracy issues and receivers reacting poorly to bullet passes. But we'll be talking more about that stuff in part three. Because you can't flip your nickel formation, even if you are expecting a three receiver formation from the offense, you are probably better served to call a dime defense instead of a nickel defense in order to ensure that the slot receivers are covered by a dime backer instead of a safety or linebacker. Of course, if the offense throws a bunch or trips formation at you, then you might just kind of be screwed. At least in Axis, you can audible to a zone defense and or shift your linebackers and DBs left or right in order to get better positioning against those receivers. Sadly, the CPU defense doesn't seem to ever shift its players in Axis, and Maximum doesn't even have a mechanic for shifting your secondary at all. You can only shift your down linemen. Despite the inability of the CPU teams to make necessary adjustments to stop repetitive user play calling, most of the time, both games make sound and varied play calls, even if they do feel a bit pedestrian most of the time. I tend to like Axis's play calling and execution better than Maximum's. Uh, I found that Maximum's CPU has a lot of trouble running the ball and is forced to rely on mobile quarterbacks to move the ball on the ground. This means that it's far too easy to simply play the pass in maximum and still be able to adequately contain the run. Both the run and the pass can be a threat in Axis, however. This forces the user to have to commit more to defending one or the other. Playing the run will leave you more vulnerable to the pass, and vice versa. Axis also has much more effective play-action plays, and I'll admit that I've fallen for some of the CPU play-action plays pretty hard and given up big plays. I never fall for Maximum's play-action because there is a bug in the game that shows the CPU offense's play-action play art whenever I view my defensive play art, which I do every play just to make sure that all of my guys are lined up on the right receivers. That still has not been fixed by Canuck Play even months after release. So, oops, I guess. And you know what? Every now and then, these games will even surprise me with a really good play call on offense or defense. 
One play call that I really liked in Axis football was this defensive call by Buffalo on a third down and four. They came out in this 6-2 front, and I read a man coverage pre-snap based on the safety lining up directly over top of the bunch receiver. But when the ball is snapped, the defense surprises me by backing off and rolling into a cover three shell. This is a rare standout play in Axis for two reasons. One, it appears that maybe I was wrong and that the CPU actually can shift its defensive alignment, as evidenced by the fact that the safety is lined up over my bunch receiver, despite the fact that he's in a center deep zone of a cover three scheme and the base alignment should put him right in the middle of the defense. So if they can shift their safeties to disguise their coverage, uh, which is a very clever trick by the AI, if that is indeed what it is doing here, then why don't they shift their D-line or linebackers to better contain the run? Ah, well. In any case, the second reason that this is a standout play for me is that it almost makes it look like the CPU actually does know that I heavily favor running the ball and that they are playing against that. Almost. And it's a really good example of what we could see if the CPU is actually able to recognize and adapt to user play calling tendencies. Anyway, I really like this play call because playing zone in this 6 2 formation should, in principle, allow the defense to guard against the run while still being able to respect the pass. Uh, this is a third and medium ish situation, so it's not out of the question to run here, but you would probably kind of err towards wanting to defend the pass because, you know, four yards is right at that threshold of where you expect an effective uh, running game to, you know, be able to average. Anyway, they have eight or nine defenders in the box, all playing zone with their eyes in the backfield in case I do run. But the roll to cover three means that they aren't going to easily give up a deep pass over the top either. It's just an all-around damn fine play call for the situation. Um, Unfortunately for the CPU, it ends up not working because the defensive line does not maintain containment, and my quarterback is able to escape the pocket and run for a first down. And this isn't so much the fault of the play calling or even of the design of the play. Really, it's just a limitation in how Axis football's blocking works and the fact that like they don't really make pockets and there's no real containment logic for defensive pass rushers. And that's something that we can maybe talk more about in the next video if we have time. But perhaps the biggest problem that both games run into is just the lack of variety in the available plays. This is especially problematic in Maximum Football, since all teams share the same playbook. It is therefore a lot easier for me to recognize a particular play coming from the CPU if I myself run that play a lot. Without pulling linemen, functional screen passes, or functional draw plays, or other effective play fakes, as I've established in my previous video, the defensive reads are just far too simple in maximum. Axis at least has different playbooks with different formations and plays, so every team is not calling plays from the same exact pool of options. This means that Axis is at least more likely to give me an offensive or defensive look that I simply haven't seen as much and aren't as familiar with. And the different teams also, therefore, have a bit more of a defined play-calling personality. Uh, Some run predominantly tighter formations with more uh, run-heavy plays. Uh, Some like to spread their formations out and throw down the field more. And yet others will rely more on short ball control passes. That being said, my experience has been that all the teams seem to fall back on passing a bit too early. If any team falls behind by more than seven-ish points, I've noticed that they tend to give up on the run almost completely, no matter what their playbook composition is, and no matter how effective their run-pass balance has been prior, and even if it's still in the first half. Uh, As another aside, it's also a bit more difficult to call defensive plays in Axis Football 2020, because the defensive play call screen does not show the offense's personnel. This means I have no idea if I should be using my base defense or putting in a nickel or dime back. I only have the down, distance, and, you know, general game situation 
in order to make that determination. So I end up playing a lot more nickel and dime on third and fourth down. The offense's personnel was shown in previous versions of Axis football, so I'm assuming that the lack of this feature is an unfortunate oversight by the UI designer when they revamped the whole game's UI for 2020. I'm really surprised that it's been months since the game's release and it still hasn't been added by a patch. Uh, Hopefully it shows up in a patch at some point. Anyway, since all teams in Maximum Football share a copy of the same playbook, they lack any real identity. They'll call any play from any formation on both offense and defense. For example, the triple option service academies don't run the triple option. Part of that is because the game simply doesn't include the triple option or any option plays or concepts at all. But because all the teams in Maximum share the same playbook, they can hypothetically call any play from any formation at any time. There's nothing stopping, say, a service academy like Colorado Springs from coming out in a four or five receiver set. There's similarly nothing stopping a spread team like Tuscaloosa or Baton Rouge from calling a run out of the flex bone. At this point, I sadly do have to stop and make a correction and also sort of a retraction, to a previous video. Uh, Back in October of 2020, I published a video about the release problems with Maximum Football 2020, and I brought up this same criticism about teams all having the same playbook. I went even further and also said that all teams play exactly the same. I demonstrated this by showing an example clip of Logan calling passes out of the spread formation, and I asserted that Logan is Maximum Football's stand-in for the real-life Air Force Academy. I was mistaken. For some reason, I was thinking that the city of Logan is in Colorado uh, when I was writing the script. Somehow, I didn't realize my mistake when I was recording the narration, or when I was adding plays to Logan's playbook, or when I was capturing the footage, or when I was editing the video, or when I finally got around to publishing it. Oops. The city of Logan is, in fact, in Utah, and Logan is Maximum Football's replacement for Utah State University. Air Force's stand-in within Maximum Football is not Logan, it is Colorado Springs, the Air Force Academy being located outside of the city of Colorado Springs. Uh, Maybe Canuck could have helped me out a little bit by calling the school Colorado Springs Academy in order to keep it consistent with the New York Academy and the Maryland Academy, which are the game stand-ins for Army and Navy respectively, but whatever. It was my mistake. Worse yet, my assumption that Logan was the stand-in for Air Force led me to erroneously conclude that none of the teams in in the game play particularly different from one another. This is also not, in fact, true. After further testing and experimentation with the game, including watching more games with the included spectator mode, I found that even though all teams do share the same playbook, that much is true, they do nevertheless have their own specific play-calling preferences and tendencies, as Canuck promised in pre-release promotional materials. Uh, That being said, I was still correct in that there is still substantial overlap between play calling and any team is still liable to call any play from any formation. And a lot of what makes every team in Maximum feel similar to play against is the fact that every CPU quarterback in the game is very run happy. They'll scramble at the drop of a hat and defenses have a really hard time containing them, even if you call QB spy plays, which pretty much don't work at all. The coaches will also call a lot of designed quarterback runs. This is true even if the CPU team's quarterback is not particularly mobile. So I don't think the teams are using their quarterback's uh, speed or agility ratings as much of a determinant of whether or not they'll try doing quarterback runs. Much of the success of CPU offenses in maximum football basically comes down to whether the quarterback is elusive enough for all these scrambles and designed QB runs to actually work. If the quarterback can run then the offense will perform well. If the quarterback can't run, they'll have a lot of three and outs. Every team seems to live or die on the legs of its quarterback, regardless of its team composition or its play-calling philosophy. 
This is in stark contrast to Axis football, in which pocket passing quarterbacks will stay in the pocket and won't be particularly effective on the move if they do decide to scramble. Uh, so, no, Colorado Springs does not play exactly like Logan. Colorado Springs will run a very run-oriented offense, and they are also much more likely to call plays out of their unique flexbone formation or the full formation or the wishbone formations. They uh, will also run three, four, or five receiver sets, or they'll run run plays out of the shotgun, which is uncharacteristic of the Air Force team that inspired them, but they'll still be running the ball. So Maximum Football 2020's play calling from team to team is not nearly as identical or as much of a problem as I said it was back in October. That was my mistake. I was wrong. And to its credit, Colorado Springs in Maximum Football 2020 does look a lot more like Air Force than they did in 2019's version of the game. It is, however, worth noting that these preferences are not displayed to the user anywhere. I have not found any way to view or customize a team's play calling preferences within the play designer or in any of the team customization menus. So if you want to redesign a team's playbook within the included play designer, you still can't change the respective team's play calling preferences in order to ensure that they will actually call the created plays that you gave them in a game. Uh, I did this mistakenly with Logan, who never called the plays that I created because they don't run a run-heavy uh, offense, and then I did it again with Colorado Springs to add more flexbone uh, run concepts that are more similar to Air Force's actual offense, at least as close as I can get in a game that doesn't support option concepts at all. And yes, uh, Colorado Springs does actually run my created plays every now and then. Axis may only have about a half dozen or so different offensive playbooks and only two different defensive playbooks, but that small addition ends up making a huge difference in ensuring that individual matches play out differently and the different teams will play differently from one another. I haven't done enough testing and simulation with the game's franchise mode to know how well Axis' CPU team building logic works. That is, I'm not sure how they draft players, sign free agents, or make trades, and if any of that stuff is based on their specific style or playbook. For example, does a team that runs a 3-4 defense know to look to add extra depth for inside linebacker positions and that they can get away with fewer defensive tackles? Will a team that favors a power running playbook look for a second running back with a good blocking attribute to fill in the fullback position? while a single-back or air-raid offense will be more interested in speedy backs who can catch out of the backfield. Will that power running team actually know to sub in that blocking back into the fullback position, or do they just put their second-best runner in the fullback position regardless of whether he's a good blocker or not? I honestly have not done exhaustive testing in this regard, so I cannot say with any certainty one way or the other. I do know that the depth chart in Axis does correctly show nose tackles and two inside linebackers for 3-4 defenses, as compared to two tackles and a single inside linebacker for the 4-3 defenses. So it at least gets that much right. I'm assuming that the CPU teams should at least know how many starters they need for each position and should build their team accordingly. I'm not sure how sophisticated other areas of team building are, for example, from what I can tell, every team seems to assign its best offensive linemen into the tackle positions, then into the center position, and then guards. And the priority goes to the player at the top of the depth chart, so the best offensive lineman will almost always seem to be the left tackle. Second best will be the right tackle, then center, then left guard, then right guard. There's similar logic for linebackers, with the best linebackers being assigned to the outside spots for 3-4 defenses. 4-3 defenses, however, just seem to go in depth chart order, so left linebacker, middle linebacker, right linebacker. And similarly for defensive backs, the top DBs are usually assigned as corners, then as safeties, then nickels and dime backs. 
Uh, and for some reason, the left defensive spots seem to be on the offense's left and on the defense's right, which is a little bit confusing and counterintuitive. I'm not quite sure why they do it that way. I've seen some lineups that have lower rated players in higher positions on the depth chart, but I'm pretty sure this was always due to a backup taking the spot of an injured starter. They don't shift the whole depth chart. They just place the reserve player in the spot for the injured starter. But if you have done more exhaustive testing in this regard, then please feel free to let me know in the comments uh, what you found, or if you've made your own video on the topic, feel free to link it in the comments. For example, here's the Philadelphia Express running back depth chart. The starting running back has a slightly higher overall rating, but he's considerably slower and better at blocking than the player who's in the fullback position. The starting running back has ratings more appropriate to a power fullback, while the fullback has ratings more appropriate to a tailback. Maybe the CPU is worried about that fumble rating for its quicker back, so they relegated him to fullback so that he won't get the ball as much? Hmm, I don't know. I see similar lineups on other teams as well. Even in situations in which both runners have the same overall rating, I'm not seeing the better blocking back being assigned as the fullback. One of the things that I really like about Axis football in particular is that the game gives players these fuzzy grades instead of absolute numeric ratings. Unlike Maximum Football or Madden or heck even NFL 2K5, Axis football does not show absolute numeric ratings out of 100. Instead, it gives a grade that covers a small range of those absolute numeric ratings. Each player still has an absolute rating on a scale of 100, and you can actually see this uh, between seasons during the player progression stage, which will show you how many numeric points each player has gained or lost in each attribute for that year. But you, and I'm assuming the CPU, never gets to see these absolute ratings. As a team-building GM, this means that I have to make judgment calls about where to put certain players on the depth chart based on other ratings besides their overall. If I have two receivers with the same overall grade, for example C+, competing for the same slot wide receiver position, do I prefer the quicker receiver or the one with better hands? It's up to me. You don't get as much of this with other football games because how often do you get two players in the same position that have exactly the same rating out of 100? You know, usually you'll get one player who's like one or two points overall better, and then you just put that player higher in the depth chart. Whereas in this system in Axis, it's a toss-up. Uh, this is more similar to how I would prefer football games handle player attribute ratings, because in real life, you don't know exactly how good a player is uh, at any particular thing that they do, and it's really hard to directly compare players in any sort of absolute scale. I've talked about this in past blog and videos, and I've pitched the idea of giving rookies a range of ratings, which then narrow as the player gets more playtime and practice. That way, you, as the coach or GM, actually have to practice with those players or put them into actual games in order to find out exactly how good they are. This could be a good use case for the addition of preseason games to access this franchise mode, and maybe even a ch uh, changing the weekly practice menu so that it allows the user to allocate time between starters and reserves in order to evaluate young players during weekly practice but at the cost of giving less reps to your veteran starters. This would also help to make the practice squad much more relevant within the game. I'm not sure what rating the CPU might use as a tiebreaker for evaluating a starter if the overall is the same. Maybe they look at awareness, maybe the rating they look at is position specific, or I don't know, maybe the CPU can see the absolute ratings which are hidden to the user. I'm not sure. I'm even less sure of how Maximum's team building and recruiting logic works. Since all the teams share the same playbooks, do they even try to recruit and build a roster for a specific style of play? Or do they just look for the best available players at their weakest and shallowest positions? Or do they not even do that? Do they just look for the best players overall? <sighs> it's impossible to really test this, since the game doesn't show me what each other team's scheme and play-calling preferences are supposed to be. 
They don't show it in the customization menu or in the play designer or in the team select screen. So I have no way of knowing what types of players the CPU teams should even be looking for. Uh, Hopefully the CPU teams at least know what the heck they're supposed to be looking for. I've already established that the coaches don't seem to call plays based on the strengths or weaknesses of their personnel, as evidenced by the fact that they'll keep running with immobile quarterbacks. So I am skeptical that it works the other way around either, that, you know, they would make personnel decisions based on their play calling preferences. I honestly don't know. Heck, I'm not even sure what logic the CPU is using to set its depth charts in maximum football. I pretty easily figured out how Axis assigns players uh, to its depth chart, but Maximum is not using even remotely similar logic. Scanning other teams' depth charts, I sometimes see higher-rated players placed lower on the depth chart. For example, Denver State here has their best receiver assigned to the slot position. Is this because their top two receivers were hurt and replaced with lower-rated reserves? I don't know, because the game doesn't have an injury report anywhere in the Dynasty Hub, so I don't know who's hurt. Or is this a deliberate choice by the AI? Did they possibly do this because they favor three or four wide receiver sets, and they like to call plays specifically designed to go to the slot receiver? You know, is this like a Wes Welker kind of thing? Again, I doubt that the team building and play calling logics are this specific, let alone this synchronized. I do like that Maximum has this little news feed on the Dynasty Hub, which shows recent uh, recent transactions. This is college football, which means that there aren't trades or free agent signings or teams activating players off of the practice squad. Instead, it just shows key injuries and recruiting commitments, including transfers and the very rare uh, academic suspension. But this does give the user a better idea of what's going on around the league even if there's not really all that much that you can do about it. In my opinion, Axis really should have something like this in their uh, franchise, considering that Axis has so much more going on in its franchise mode. Axis has trades, it has free agent signings, it has practice squads, it has facility upgrades, it has coach hirings and firings, and it has scouting and other weekly activities beyond just players getting injured and returning from injuries. But none of this activity among the broader league is shown to the user at all anywhere in the game. So I have no idea how much the CPU uses these features of the game, let alone how well they are utilizing them. But let us not forget that there is more play calling than just offense and defensive play calling. Special teams play calling can be especially confounding in both games. Both games have trouble deciding when to kick. In this first example from Axis Football, the CPU punts on a fourth and four from the 31-yard line with less than four minutes in the game. Now, granted, there is like an 11-mile-an-hour crosswind that would have made this field goal considerably tougher. But then again, kickers in this game are routinely making 50 and 60 yard field goals regardless of wind. This was a makeable kick in this game. But even if the CPU didn't have confidence in their kicker to kick in that crosswind, then this is definitely four down territory. Are they playing for the tie? Why would you not go for it this late in this in the game at this part of the field with this down and distance to go? They end up going for it on their next possession on 4th and 7 from the 37-yard line, which is a worse situation than the previous situation, and even then, they end up running a simple off-tackle play and fail to convert. That game, by the way, went into Axis Football's rather nonsensical overtime. No coin toss, no kickoff, no sudden death or hybrid sudden death, or college rules. Instead, the game just adds one minute to the fourth quarter each time the clock expires with a tied score. The CPU won thanks to a blown coverage. The game then still gave my coach credit for the win anyway. I had a similar problem last year in which my coach was being given the record of the worst team in the league after every game that I played, which resulted in my coach getting losses even when I won. 
This time around, however, I'm getting credit for wins even when I lose, but only sometimes. So I'm not sure what's going on here. My team finished that season 12 and 4, but my coach's record showed 15 and 1 at the end of the season. Similarly, I've seen Maximum Football's CPU line up for punts inside the opponent's 40 yard line instead of kicking a field goal or going for it. But then I've also seen them get so desperate that they'll line up for a field goal from their own 40-yard line and attempt an almost 70-yard field goal uh, to try to win the game instead of going for it on fourth and continuing the drive. So uh, is some iffy play calling there, too. Maximum football CPU coaches are programmed to try to make bold decisions from time to time, such as going for a two-point conversion in the fourth quarter to win a game rather than tie it. I do like that stuff like this is in the game, but the CPU can still be overly predictable with such play calls. In fact, in Maximum Football, I usually just assume that the CPU will try to go for it too in the fourth quarter, because they do it far more often than they probably should. I don't think I've ever seen the CPU go for a two-point conversion in Axis Football, unless they were losing late in the game and were trying to catch up. They also never seem to proactively go for two in order to ice a victory or in an attempt to win instead of tie the game. Or at least, if they do ever make that decision, I've yet to see it. Canuck's single-minded insistence that the CPU go for two late in the game also frequently backfires on the CPU. In this example, the CPU scores a touchdown to take a 20-17 lead late in the third. It then decides to go for a two-point conversion instead of kicking the PAT. This is a situation in which the simple arithmetic does not say that you should go for two, as it provides absolutely no benefit. One point would put them up by four, which would force me to have to score a touchdown and would prevent me from being able to score a field goal to tie it. Converting for two to go up by five would not change the fact that I would still need a touchdown, and it wouldn't change the fact that that one TD would still be sufficient for me to take back the lead. The CPU also ends up failing to convert, leaving this a field goal game. I got that field goal midway through the fourth to tie the game. The CPU's subsequent TD to retake the lead then put them back up by seven. But had they settled for one point earlier, they'd now be up by eight, assuming I had kicked a field goal and not made a touchdown previously, which would force me to then have to convert a two-point conversion in order to just tie the game. The decision to go for two instead of kick the PAT ended up making the game less challenging for me because it put less pressure on me to need touchdowns instead of field goals. Funny enough, this same exact school committed another two-point conversion faux pas in the previous season. They had lined up to go for a two-point conversion to win the game, but had the successful conversion called back on a holding penalty. They opted to retry the two-point conversion from the longer distance and failed to convert. Just take the points and go to overtime. Don't try a two-point conversion from the seven-yard line. What do you think this is, the XFL? The lack of trick plays, such as fake punts, fake field goals, and the like, also severely limits the creativity of both teams. If the place kicker or punter steps onto the field in either game, the team is kicking. You do not need to respect the possibility of a fake or trick play at all. Feel free to manually blitz a speedy corner to try to block the kick because there is absolutely no risk to you for doing so. Of course, the CPU does not seem to know this, so they won't try blitzing their corners in a similar fashion, even in desperate situations in which a blocked kick could potentially turn the tide of a game. Maximum doesn't even have onside kicks. Axis does have onside kicks, but I've found them all but impossible to convert. Big problems will also arise when either game tries to deviate from the more common-sense play-calling strategies. I'm going to highlight a couple of examples of each game trying to do something unexpected, only to have it blow up in their face. In this first example from Axis Football 2020, the CPU is in fourth and goal from the opponent's 19-yard line in the fourth quarter, down by 14 points. They got backed up due to a penalty and a sack in previous plays. They end up settling on calling a simple outside run play in this game-deciding situation. It's not a draw 
or a screen or an end around or a jet sweep to catch the defense off guard and get one of their elite playmakers in space in a desperate situation. It's just a mundane, simple off tackle play on fourth and 19. Almost any passing play, particularly something like a corner, deep comeback, or post route, would have had a much higher chance of success in this situation, but they just go with a basic run play. This wasn't the only time that I saw this happen either. The CPU made a similar decision in another game later in the season on a fourth and goal from the 19. Sadly, I don't have footage of that second occurrence. I think I alt-tabbed out of the game earlier, which stopped the recording, and I simply forgot to turn it back on, even though I did go to the trouble of making a note of when it happened so that I would remember to go back to it later. But eh, my bad. Anyway, the fact that this happened more than once in a single season shows me that this is probably not a total fluke occurrence, and is probably going to be something that will happen much more often than I would like for it to. Switching now to the other game, Maximum Football, and on to the other side of the ball, here is Maximum Football calling a goal line defense in the middle of the field. They blitz both corners with no safety help and leave my wideouts completely uncovered for what is essentially a free touchdown. This goes so far beyond zero blitz, and it is just plain reckless play calling. Maximum Football's AI loves calling this goal line defense all over the field. In Maximum Football 19, it was actually surprisingly effective, and I would even go so far as to say maybe even unfair to the user, because in Maximum 19, there was a slight input delay when uh, pressing the button to throw the ball. This slight delay would often give the defense just enough time to get home on the sack before my quarterback gets the ball off to an uncovered receiver in a situation like this. In Maximum Football 2020, however, that input delay is gone or so short that it's, you know, negligible and I don't notice it. So I actually have the time to get the ball off. The CPU in this case should not be calling these goal line plays uh, from this goal line formation in the middle of the field, especially not as often as they do. I mean, maybe, I guess, if it's like third and one or fourth and one or something, and they're going all out on trying to stop the run. But even then, it should only be if the offense is fielding some kind of heavy set that does not have any wideouts on the field. Maybe, I guess. Just, you know what? Don't blitz both corners and leave the wideouts completely uncovered, okay? Just don't. And the unfortunate truth is that I see these sorts of boneheaded play calls at least once, usually more, in every match of both Axis football and Maximum football that I play. I can't possibly show you all of them. These sorts of play calls make both games feel less competitive than they should be because the CPU just hands me free points or defensive stops that I don't actually have to earn. In general, however, I found that Axis football tends to be a little bit more competitive. First and foremost, it has actual difficulty settings, so that definitely helps. Maximum, on the other hand, only has these CPU sliders but they all affect both the CPU players and the human team's players. So if I'm like trying to improve the CPU team's run blocking in order to make them more competent at running the ball, it only serves to also make my own running game easier too, and thus keeps the overall competitive balance about the same, or maybe even gives me even more of an edge. Once again, I want to emphasize that even though I see these sorts of awful outcomes in almost every match that I play in both of these games, these are still edge case outliers. There's a lot of plays in a game of football, and the vast majority of the CPU play calling on, you know, first through third down is sound, and I don't have much to complain about there. Neither game is overly predictable, yet... As I've alluded to previously, Axis gets the definite edge in this regard, since it has a wider array of formations, each with more plays. So when the Axis CPU lines up in a particular formation, I don't immediately know that it's one of two or three plays, which is the unfortunate case for Maximum Football. 
Both games will also mix up the run and the pass on first and second downs, and the exact ratio will depend on the specific team's play calling tendencies and, in the case of Axis, their specific playbook and what plays are available to them. So even though I just spent the majority of the last 40 minutes listing problems with both games, I don't want you to walk away with the impression that both games are completely broken. They're not. I'm just pointing out the areas in which they don't work as well, because those are the things that need to be fixed. Now, one area of both games' coaching logic that I have noticed seems to be consistently broken, or which is making bad decisions, is CPU clock management. I actually have to wonder if Axis Football accidentally inverted some of its logic somewhere, as it seems to me like the CPU really likes to call timeouts when it actually favors me for them to have done so but then they don't always call timeouts when they actually need them. Uh, for example, I might convert a third down late in the half inside the two-minute warning, and the CPU will call a timeout for me, allowing me to continue my drive now with the first down and without having to waste my own timeout. Then, when the CPU gets the ball back, they either don't have any timeouts left, or they don't bother to call them. Or, inversely, the CPU in Axis might take a sack on a third down and then call their timeout, but then punt the ball on fourth down anyway, which only gives me even more time to convert for an end of half score without me again having to spend any of my own timeouts. In one instance, I actually saw the CPU in Axis call one timeout to conserve time on a drive while they were trailing late in the fourth quarter. They got into field goal range with the last like 20 or 30 seconds ticking away. They came out to kick the field goal, but even though they had a timeout left, they did not call it to stop the clock. The clock ended up expiring before they were able to snap the ball for the kick attempt, and they ended up losing the game because of it, with the timeout in their pocket. And sometimes they just flat out don't call any timeouts at all, no matter what the game situation is and they'll lose the games because of it, again, making them less competitive than they should be. The hike. Pass complete to number 15. The offense felt like it could convert on fourth down, but the defense was up to the challenge. What a game today, Mike. Uh, Maximum Football 2020 launched without any apparent clock management logic at all, at least not in the college rules that uh, most people are probably playing because of the, you know, college dynasty feature being the game's main selling point. So CPU teams were never calling timeouts at all. Uh, I'm actually not going to talk too much about this particular is issue in Maximum for two reasons. Uh, the first is that I already covered it in my Maximum Football 2020 kickoff problems video. And two, to their credit, Canuck Play has since patched the game to fix these problems with clock management. The CPU teams will now call timeouts in situations when it's appropriate for them to do so. Just like in Axis, they aren't super efficient at using their timeouts. And they will still call timeouts at weird times that seem to favor me more than it favors the CPU. But hey, at least they are calling them now and not just letting the clock run out. Even with uh, timeout logic now in place in the game, uh, Maximum Football's CPU tends to wait until after the little post-play cutscenes before they try calling their timeouts. This effectively runs well over five seconds off of the clock after every play. And I've actually seen the CPU run out of time and not be able to make a game-winning field goal attempt because they let these five or so seconds run off the clock without calling a timeout, and then the game ended with them still having a timeout in their pocket. Uh, Maximum's CPU timeout logic does not seem to extend much beyond if it's inside of two minutes and the clock is running, call a timeout. 
They don't take more detailed situations into account. If they just fail to convert a third down with a minute left in the half, and they are going to kick a field goal anyway, they'll call a timeout still. It doesn't matter to them that they can't possibly run out of time before kicking that field goal, and the net effect is that they end up only giving me more time to try to put together a scoring drive and spare me from having to call one of my own timeouts. Neither game has included a proper hurry-up offense either. There's no support in either game for no huddles of any kind, so I can't really talk about how the CPU manages a hurry-up offense because, well, they don't. What I can say is that even though Axis has an accelerated clock, which, by the way, works very well and is a very good feature in that game and in all football games and Canuck play, you really need to put an accelerated clock setting in maximum. Like, it's just, it's got to be there. Uh, But anyway, even though it works well in Axis, it does not activate inside of the two-minute warning. This ends up allowing both the user and CPU team to get in and out of the huddle in no time at all, and reduces the need to even bother to use your timeouts to begin with. Madden, by the way, does the same thing with its accelerated clock, and it infuriates me in both games. This is the time in the game when it is most important to simulate the time taken in the huddle, and none of these football games bother to do so. Axis at least has the excuse of not having the no huddle mechanics, so the fact that it doesn't run the clock might be a balance concession. Madden, though, does have no huddle mechanics, so that game has no excuse to stop the clock after every play with the accelerated clock on. Look, developers, if you have users complaining that the accelerated clock is unfair somehow, I don't know, maybe in multiplayer games or whatever, then just make it a setting whether or not it runs inside the two-minute drill. Uh, Have one setting for accelerated clock runoff outside of two minutes, and then a second setting for two-minute drill runoff. That way, the user can even choose to give the offense a few more seconds in the two-minute drill in order to kind of simulate the idea that the offenses are, are getting in and out of their huddles quicker. And it isn't just timeout use or lack of timeout use during the two-minute drill that is problematic. Neither game seems to acknowledge the existence of a four-minute drill. I've never seen the CPU in either game start taking timeouts or increasing their tempo with three to four minutes left in the half, which is something that is very common in real football. But of course, if you're only playing the game on five-minute long quarters, then, you know, that's almost the entire second half anyway, uh, which is something that I've already discussed in my first episode of how Madden fails to simulate football. And even outside of four minutes left in the half, timeout usage feels unrealistic in that the CPU teams don't use timeouts at all, except when trying to conserve clock inside of two minutes. The CPU does not call timeouts in order to slow down an up-tempo offense, in part because neither game supports a no-huddle. The CPU does not call a timeout to give a tired defense a breather late in an extended ball control drive. They don't call timeouts because the other team gives them a highly unfavorable pre-snap read against the play they had selected, whether it's on offense or defense. They don't call timeouts to prevent a delay of game, in part because there's always too much time on the play clock for delay of game to ever be a real risk. They also never run a designed no-play in which they try to use a hard count to bait the uh, defense into jumping off sides on like a third and short or fourth and short, uh, and then end up having to call a timeout to avoid a delay of game if the defense doesn't jump. Uh, They won't call a timeout if they are, say, lining up for a long field goal as the final seconds tick away from a quarter, and they want to prevent flipping sides of the field so that they can kick with, with a strong wind instead of having to kick against it. Neither game supports coaches' challenges in order to review plays at the risk of losing a timeout if the call on the field is not overturned. These are all situations in which a real-life football team may call a timeout when not trying to run a hurry-up offense. But teams in Axis and Maximum don't call timeouts in any of these situations, in part because many of these situations simply are not modeled by either game. But this, of course, ends up meaning that the CPU team pretty much always goes into the two-minute drill with all three of their timeouts for the half. So it isn't just the inappropriate use of timeouts as the half closes out that causes problems with the game's AI. It's also the lack of timeout situations in general throughout the rest of the game 
and the fact that the CPU never has to make these cost-benefit analyses on whether or not to use a timeout versus saving it for the late half uh, drive. And whew, I did not expect this video to be this long. Thank you and congratulations if you made it this far. I was expecting this video to be somewhere in the 20 to 30 minute range, but as I continued to go through my collected footage and notes, I just kept finding more mechanics and examples that I wanted to cite. And before I knew it, here we are up over 50 minutes. I promise that the next part, which will be about individual player AI, will not drag on for this long. I'm pretty confident that I can keep it in that 20 to 30 minute expected range. If you want to see that next video when it gets released, please remember to subscribe and hit that notification bell. This hour-long video was also a lot of work, so if you enjoyed it, I really hope that you'll check out my Patreon page and consider making a contribution. All patrons will get exclusive previews of upcoming content, including the next video in this series, and patrons at higher tiers will have the additional benefit of early access to content, the ability to vote on polls of upcoming content, and other perks. And yes, that early access will again include the third part of this particular video series. More perks may also be added as my support base grows, and the funds go directly towards the purchase of new and used games that I use for research, as well as towards the maintenance of MegaBearsFan.net, my personal blog, and towards the software licenses that I use to create this content. Ah, <sighs> I remember in the good old days when you can buy the license to a software and use it for as long as you want. Now Adobe expects me to pay $15 a month for Premiere. As I hit each of my funding goals, I also intend to make matching donations to a charity or nonprofit, so a portion of your donations will also go towards good causes. Thanks again for watching, and I hope to see you back in a few weeks for part three.